in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 this morning. We passed the Bibles out, so you can go ahead and turn there today with just a, a handful of verses this morning. We're going to finish off this chapter beginning in verse 7 all the way through verse 18. And so the Bible says in verse 7, But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look stead steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds it much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. A lot of glory going on in these verses today, as you can tell. Uh, let's pray. Father, we love you so much. God, we're thankful today for your word. We pray in this time that we have together, Father, that you would pour your glory out on our lives. And God, I pray that there would be a resurgence within our hearts of amazement, of love, of appreciation, a stirring once again, an awareness that you would bring of all that you've done for us. And God, as we hold in our hands your very word, that even that, God, there'd be a, a fresh appreciation that you would stir within our hearts that would be accompanied by a passion to pursue you and to do all things for your glory. God, we confess today we need you to fall upon our lives and bring that to us. God, apart from you, we remember we can do nothing. And so would you grant that today? God, would you cause your glory to fall in this place on every life, on every mind, for those in the overflow, for those listening online, God, the desire of our heart is to hear your voice. And so speak now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to say something to you this morning that I know that you know, but I'm going to say it to you again anyway. This book is the most amazing book in the history of humanity. More copies have been sold, more people have read this book than any other book written. And not only that, we know that while human beings were instruments in the writing of this book, this book was authored by God. This is the testimony of the scripture. This just isn't my idea this morning. It's not just a tradition that we have in Christianity, albeit it is the tradition that we have in Christianity. The Bible says it itself. It's unique in this respect that it claims to be authored by God himself. Now, I know for some of us, uh, maybe we're new to the faith, you just gave your life to the Lord. Um, as you look at your Bible, sometimes it can be a daunting prospect to, to uh, consider all that is written, all of the information contained within the volume of this book. Sometimes even in our devotional time, you know, it can be so overwhelming, we're not necessarily where, sure where to begin, where to start, what book we should read. Um, I just want to give you a very brief over, overview this morning of the Bible. There are 39 books in the Old Testament. There are 27 books in the New Testament. Three quarters of your Bible is Old Testament. One quarter of your Bible is New Testament. For many of us, you know, we haven't even really ventured into the Old Testament. Maybe we got a brand new Bible. Uh, maybe we've had this Bible the one that you're reading today for many years, and as you look at the gilded edges, these are still golden and crispy, and then the corner of the New Testament is nice and worn. I, I see that sometimes, you know, as we look at the scriptures, it can be so overwhelming, such a daunting prospect to read through the whole Bible, that there may actually be parts of the Bible that are unventured in our experience of God and His Word. The Old Testament principally was centered around the law that was given through Moses. The New Testament is centered around grace that came through Jesus Christ. But I, I want to say this to you. The Bible is one single unit. It's not two different testaments with two different stories. This is one book in two different parts. And I think it's important for us to remember that. Uh, sometimes I hear people say things like, the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. Nothing could be further from the truth. 
And that applies some sort of disjunction between the two covenants. Remember with me, this is one book. It's a unified book. It's a unity. It is one book with two different parts. The Old Testament is predominantly focused on the law of Moses that laid the groundwork for what would be fulfilled in the New Testament. Did I say that right? Good. Let me say it again just to make sure. The Old Testament is basically centered on the law of Moses that provided the framework which was fulfilled in the New Testament through the coming of Jesus Christ. The single message of the Bible is this, God's salvation for all of humanity. If you want it in a nutshell, if you're a bottom line type of person today, that's the message of this book. God's salvific plan, God's plan of salvation or redemption for all of humanity. John said it like this, and we're beginning a study in the gospel according to John on Wednesday nights. We'd love to have you come. It may be a long study. We made it through one verse last Wednesday night. So, so look at Jesus probably will come back before we finish that gospel account. But join, join us for it. I think it's going to be a, a great study. I'm excited. It's, the title of it is simply Jesus because that's what John gives us. But he said this about the life and the ministry of the Lord as it's related through the law of Moses. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. There are two testaments. There are two covenants. It just basically means agreements. There's the law and there's grace. And this is Paul's point this morning. They're both glorious. The old covenant, the old agreement, the law that came through Moses was glorious. But the New Testament, the new covenant, grace that came through Jesus Christ is that much more glorious. It is amazing. Can you say amazing today? Very good. Very nice. If you were to compare them, it would be something like the moon compared to the sun. It would be something like a lake compared to the ocean. Comparing the Old Testament, the law of Moses to grace that came through Jesus Christ. This was a big deal for the apostle because he was a Pharisee. He had been a doctor of the law. He had memorized the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, the law of Moses. He had committed to memory. He was a zealot when it came to the law. And now having been redeemed, brought into this glorious new covenant, new testament, as he compared the two, and this is really the the thrust of this morning's Bible study, as he compared the two, and we touched on it a little bit last week, as he compared the two, he conveys this message that the new covenant, the new agreement, the new testament that God has brought to humanity through Jesus Christ is that much more glorious. Now, notice again with me what he says in chapter 3. And I'm just going to read these verses again. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, he's talking about the the law, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Now, with a little bit of introduction, do you understand what Paul is trying to convey here? As he draws the attention of these New Testament believers back to the Old Testament, when the law of Moses was given the second time. You remember Moses came down the first time with the tablets. He didn't find the children of Israel waiting bated breath for the word of God. They'd gone right back into immorality. The law was broken, and and Moses signified it by throwing down those tablets, and they broke. Well, the, the tablets, the law, the Decalogue was given a second time. And this, w- this was how it rolled out. It was amazing. It was glorious. Moses goes back up to the top of Mount Sinai. He's on top of a mountain. He's a man who hears the word of God. A cloud falls upon the mountain. The cloud represented the glory of God. God speaks, and as Moses comes down, the Shekinah glory that was uh, manifested on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant 
was also upon his face. As he came down, as he had been in the presence of God, as he came down with the two tablets of stone, the law of God written on stone, there was a glory that was shining on the face of Moses. Now, Paul calls the giving of the law, he calls the law the ministry of death. He calls it the ministry of condemnation. I don't know if you've ever thought about the law like that before, but this is how uh, the Apostle Paul speaks of the law. Because listen, the law was given by God to reveal our sinfulness. God never gave the law to be a tool through which we seek to achieve righteousness. God never gave the law to be a tool through which, as we live it out, we seek to, in some way, justify ourselves before God. Hey, in other words, I mean something like this. I follow the law better than this person, and you know you can always find someone who's worse than you. I follow the law better than this person, and so because I exceed in morality, somehow God should receive me. I don't know if you've ever, ever had the opportunity in sharing the gospel, you've maybe asked somebody, are you going to go to heaven? Do you think that when you die, you'll live forever in the presence of God? And sometimes you may have a person say back to you, yeah, you know, I think that when I die, I'll be in the presence of God forever. And then you say to that person, well, why do you think that that's the case? Many times people will say, because I'm a good person, because I've tried to obey the Ten Commandments. But God never gave the Ten Commandments for us to use as self-justification. God gave the Ten Commandments to reveal our sinfulness. This is why they're called the ministry of death or the ministry of condemnation. So listen, uh, none of us can perform, none of us can live out the Ten Commandments perfectly. Now you may say this morning, who demands perfection? Well, his name is God. God demands perfection. That's his righteous requirement and he has every right to demand it. But listen, this is what Paul said in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 20. By the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. God gave us the law to show us that there are none who are righteous, no, not one. If you're living by the law this morning, and if you think that somehow your moral performance is earning you something in the eyes of God, you've got another thing coming. That's not the message of the Bible. The Bible says God gave the law to reveal to us our own sinfulness. And in addition to that, the law is a tutor. It teaches us, it instructs us that we need a mediator be to stand between ourselves and God. In the Old Testament, this was why animal sacrifices were instituted. As man recognized through the law that he'd sinned against God, he would go to the tabernacle or to the temple and he would offer a sacrifice, uh, the death of that animal as a substitution, and it would provide a covering, an atonement for sin. This practice stretches all the way back to the beginning in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned and God provided a tunic, a covering for them. It was the slaying of an, of, of an animal. And Paul says this covenant, this old covenant, this Old Testament, it's passing away. And it's temporariness, that's not a word this morning, but I can't think of another word, so I'm just going to use it today. May God bless you. You can add that to my uh, created words list. The temporariness of this covenant or testament uh, was symbolically expressed through the veil that Moses w was using to cover his face. So it rolled out like this. He came down from Mount Sinai. His face was glowing. The children of Israel were overwhelmed by the glory that was shining from his face. And so he covered his face with a veil until that glory passed away. The passing away of that glory was God saying symbolically, this old covenant, this old testament is not permanent it's temporary it's laying the framework or the foundation for what is going to be permanent and what is permanent is the new covenant the new testament this is an amazing picture we have a mountain again it's not mount sinai it's mount zion we have a man again it's not moses it's jesus we have a cloud again as jesus was offering up 
His sacrifice once and for all. The Bible says the sun was obscured by the clouds. The Father speaking of that moment of uh, rending when the, when the Son of God knew God forsakenness for us, for our sakes. The glory of God was poured out, not on Moses' face, but on the life of Jesus Christ as he gave his sacrifice. He was dead and buried. He rose again on the third day, and the glory of God shone through his life. In a permanent sense, he ascended to the right hand of God, and there he sits making intercession for those who come to him by faith. This is the purpose of the cross. It is the ministry of righteousness, not your righteousness, but God's righteousness. This is what God did on the cross of Christ. He satisfied his own righteous requirement. There is one person, I know you guys may know this this morning, but I'm going to... I'm going to say it again. Because sometimes, you know what we do? We go right back to the law, even as Christians. We begin in grace. We're like the churches in Galatia. We begin in grace. We're enjoying grace. And pretty soon we find ourselves, because it's human nature, going right back to the law and performance. God satisfied the righteous requirement of perfection, not through your performance, but through the performance of his son on the cross. Jesus, when he gave himself as a sacrifice, he gave himself as a perfect sacrifice. Last week, you remember when I said to you, hey, we're all going to say together, God is enough. Do you remember that? And we said, what did we say? We said God is enough. All right, not only do we say that, not only did we say last week that Jesus is enough, but God the Father said it. When Jesus died on the cross, the Father said, that's enough. That satisfied my righteous requirement. That no longer is it necessary for man to perform because my son has performed all that was necessary. So when you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, the sacrifice for sin, the perfect sacrifice of sin was made for you. And God now looks at your life and says that is enough. But not only that... Not only that, the righteousness of Christ, his own righteousness, is actually given to you. So you are clothed in the perfection of Jesus. That's an amazing thing to think about this morning. Paul said it like this, as he's talking about the gospel, as he's talking about the purpose of the law, that it was never intended to perfect us. He said, as he's talking about the glory of the gospel in Romans 3.22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. That's what God has done in your life. That's why the new covenant is that much more amazing and glorious. Because the Father has satisfied his own righteous requirement. And as you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, not only is he satisfied, he has given you the righteousness of Jesus. All of this, the Bible says, and this is, this is what Paul says here, all of this is done by the Holy Spirit as you believe. Now, I want to just reinforce that this morning by reading a couple of verses to you. Titus chapter 2, you can turn there this morning. I'm just going to read these verses. I'm not going to really comment on them. But Titus uh, chapter 2, or excuse me, chapter 3 verse 4 says this. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. I love that verse. I love the way Paul says that. It's not by our works of righteousness. It's by his mercy. The Spirit of God has washed us, has renewed us, has regenerated us. This is the work of God in our life. This is the glory of the new covenant. Not only does Paul convey this sense of it being overwhelming, he's talking about its permanence. Jesus made the perfect substitute, the book of Hebrews says, which was offered once and for all for all of mankind. He is not sacrificed over and over because the sacrifice he made was perfect the first time he gave it. Hebrews chapter 9 says it like this, as I believe Paul wrote this epistle, as the author is comparing the old and the new covenant. It says this in chapter 9, verse 13, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer 
sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Are you serving the living God today? And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So this is simply what the author is saying. There's no comparison. You can take all of the sacrifices, the blood of bulls, the blood of goats, the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer. You can put them all together. And they don't even come close to the one single offering that was made for you, that was made for me 2,000 years ago on Mount Calvary by Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God that was slain for the sin of the world. And when you put your trust, do you understand how liberating this is? Some of you today, this is your Christian experience, you're burdened down. You're burdened down by performance. You're burdened down by your failures. You're overwhelmed by what? you haven't done or you can't do or your past and we're gonna get to this in a minute but you know I can't wait I'm always jumping ahead where the Spirit of the Lord is there's liberty God has cut you loose from the law it's not about your performance anymore listen if you are a performance oriented Christian you will dig a hole for yourself spiritually that's not why Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and when he died on the cross for you he is as you believed in him, clothed you with his perfect righteousness, he has liberated you and set you free. Now you've got to catch the pathos, the emotion of the Apostle Paul. I know we read the Bible so sterilely sometimes. And I just would have loved a picture of the Apostle Paul while he, while he was writing this. I mean, he probably had this big smile on his face as he was thinking about all that Jesus Christ had done for him. And so he says in verse 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Now notice what he says here. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So Paul says, we're not unsure anymore. This is not a matter of speculation. We know what God has done, and this gives us this hope that we have, this permanent hope that we have in the sacrifice of Christ. It produces in us a boldness of speech. This is why we can speak so confidently. You know, as you read Paul's writings, these are the words that he uses. Romans chapter 8, verse 38. I am persuaded. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Be confident in this very thing that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 1. I know this is how he speaks. I know and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which we have committed to him. Do you have that type of confidence in your relationship with God? I love you guys. <laughs> if you're works oriented, you'll never have this type of confidence. If you're, if you're works oriented, you will always be wondering. If you're works oriented, you'll always be doubting. If you're works oriented, you will only be good as your, you will only be as good as your last work, as the last thing you've done. And you will see your standing before God based on your performance. And I'm telling you, it, it will be a chain that will hold you back. I know we talk about this. You guys, this is what I fear sometimes, that, that we talk so much about, and, and we should. Paul said, I, when I was in Corinth, I determined that I was just going to preach Christ and Him crucified. This is our message. 
This is our message. It is Christ and Him crucified. It's the cross and the resurrection. But sometimes what happens is we hear it over and over so much. We become gospel hardened. We become gospel hardened. Our culture, if you study the history of Christian cultures, what you're going to see in every single culture in England, in Germany, and in America is that as God pours out His Holy Spirit, as time progresses, there is a gospel hardness that sets into people. People become, people who call themselves Christians become hardened to the message of the gospel because we become so familiar with it. It's so normal for us to hear it. And I, I look at Paul's life and I think, God, I want that. God, I need that. I need that sense of glory. I need that sense of amazement. I need that sense of freshness. That's the second word. I'm not even sure it's a word this morning. Someone will correct me later. I think it is. We need that. Thank you. We need that sense of freshness in our life concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is why we need to evaluate our own lives. Lord, is it as glorious? Lord, is it as amazing? Lord, does it provoke in me this sense of worship like it did, but even on an increasing basis, an increasing basis in a greater way, because we run the risk of becoming gospel-hardened. And when we do, we revert right back to works, somehow thinking that that is going to please God. That's why Paul used words such as, I'm persuaded, or be confident, or I know and am persuaded. Knowing the glory of the New Testament gives us a boldness. Knowing the glory of the New Testament removes our blindness. Paul is speaking, of course, here of the Jew. And he's talking about how Jews in his day, as they were looking into the Old Testament, there was still a veil that reliance on the law was still for them something that was keeping them from all that God had for them through Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. There was a veil. The law was like a veil inhibiting them from seeing fully and clearly the fulfillment in Jesus the Christ. Now we know the Bible teaches that God has allowed a blindness in the heart of the Jewish people so that through their rejection, the gospel could now come th to the Gentile nations. And Paul in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 said, because of that, you should be grateful because now you've been grafted in. But don't despise those Jews because God has a plan for them as well. I could say to you today, and I know that this is the case, there are many people who are Jewish in this congregation who put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Don't give up on sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with Jewish people. Just because the Bible says there's been a blindness that is set in for a period of time, God still works in his people, and his Holy Spirit falls upon his people. And that veil is taken away when a person puts their trust and faith in Jesus Christ. So for the Jew and for the Gentile, for the Jew and for the Gentile, apart from Christ, we're living under the bondage of the law. Apart from Jesus Christ, we are aware, whether it's through the light of conscience or through the light of commandment, of our insufficiency, of our failure. We bear the guilt and the shame of our sin, and there's no escaping it. You can try to numb it with narcotics and alcohol. You can try to ignore it by seeking um, ambitions in this world or fulfilling worldly desires. But the truth of the matter is this. The only thing that's going to liberate you from the guilt and the shame that weighs down on you because you have violated the law of God and the law of conscience that he's placed in your life, the only thing that's going to bring you relief is the cross of Jesus Christ. The only thing that will lift that burden, have, have you guys read John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress? Raise your hand today if you've read that book. I want to encourage the 98% of you who have not read that book to pick it up. In, in Christian literature, it's the second most read book next to the Bible. It's a great allegory about a person's salvation and their journey to the celestial city. But it begins like this, this individual that he calls Christian is bearing a weight, is bearing a burden. And he seeks to have that burden lifted by all of these worldly things. But that burden that is weighing him down is only taken away when he comes to the cross. 
Today are you burdened down? Today are you weighted down? Today are you still living under the law? Today do you have this perspective that somehow through your righteous acts, that somehow you can merit the favor of God through your morality or through your religiosity, and yet you're still carrying the burden and the weight of sin in your life. I want to say to you today that can be lifted, that veil can be torn, the glory of God can shine in your life when you put your full trust and faith in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying. And then finally, I want you to notice in verses 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So Paul says that the Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There are certain facets of Christianity who have taken this and said, hey, you know what, we can do anything. Uh, charismatic Pentecostal uh, facet specifically saying, don't put restrictions, biblical restrictions, guidance or guidelines on us. There's liberty. And so a lot of times they find themselves using this particular verse to justify all sorts of things. But we know that Paul is talking about liberty that's provided through trust and faith in the sacrifice of Jesus. Paul is saying, listen, uh, if you've believed in Christ, the Spirit has brought you freedom. You are no longer under the law. And so he says in verse 18, we all, we all with unveiled face, everybody. You know, there is a, an egalitarianism in the body of Christ. That word simply means equality. It means that there are no classes. There's no distinctions. There's no hierarchy. That's why Paul says, we all with unveiled face. There's no class distinction in the body of Christ. Sometimes people think when we get to heaven, you know, Billy Graham's going to be sitting in the front row. Pastor Chuck will be a couple rows back from that. Pastor Derek will be sitting in the back, 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 back row. And then you'll be somewhere in the middle. We have this perspective, even in the church of class distinction and nothing could be further from the truth I've said this to you before I'll say it again the ground at the foot of the cross is level there's an equality but think about how different that is from the Old Testament two million people in uh, the desert sojourning making their way all the way up to the promised land two million people and one man one man had the glory of God shining on his face that's not the message of the New Testament. As we're all believers in Jesus Christ, the glory of God is equally fallen on all of us. And this is what Paul is saying. He's saying, as you look into the glory of Christ, as you look into the face of Christ, not the face of Moses, but as you look into the face of Christ, you are being changed or transformed. The word is metamorphosis. You are being changed or transformed into his image from glory to glory. You guys know that word metamorphosis is used when a worm turns into a butterfly, a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. This is what God is doing in your life. When you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, beforehand, you were a worm, but God is making you a butterfly. Now, I know some of you guys are like, I ain't no dang butterfly, Pastor. Don't you call me a butterfly. Can I be an eagle or something like that? No, you can't be an eagle. All right, you're a butterfly. God bless you. Be secure in your manhood. <laughs> this is the process of transformation. This is the process of transformation. This is what God is doing in your life. Your body, this is so wild. Your body is like a cocoon, all right? Some of our bodies are more like cocoons than others. <laughs> but your body is like a cocoon. And what God is doing is he is transforming you on the inside. Though the outward man is perishing, the inward man or woman is being renewed day by day. Could you imagine if in the process of metamorphosis, the caterpillar was all con consumed with the cocoon, making the cocoon look nice, making sure the cocoon had a shape, <laughs> making sure the cocoon had some hair, applying some cosmetics to the cocoon you know while all the while the real work was happening on the inside you know this is 
Well, you know how the rest of that sentence goes. We're like a cocoon. Our, our physical body is like a cocoon, and God is transforming. He's changing us on the inside from glory to glory. Not from failure, fail, failure to failure, but from glory to glory. In other words, from one glorious stage to the next. This is what God is doing. Listen, stop viewing your life through the framework of your failure. If you are going to let your failure define you, you will never fully experience all that God has for you. If you define your life by your past failure, you will never experience all that God has for you. I'm telling you today the way God sees it. According to his word, this is not just my opinion. According to God's word, as he looks at your life, this is what he sees. He sees this glorious transformation in progress. He is changing you from, from one glorious stage to another. This is the process of sanctification. This is why we say, you know, I may not be yet who I want to be, but thank God I'm not who I used to be, all right? I'm being transformed and changed. Maybe not fast enough for many of you, but I am in process, and you're in process too. And this is what's going to happen. That process will continue until you die and you fly into the presence of God bearing the image of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? This process will continue. And this is the picture, right? This cocoon is going to fall away. This old tent is going to be buried. And when that moment happens, this is why we don't fear death anymore. When that moment happens, you are going to fly into the presence of God bearing the image of Jesus Christ. This is God's purpose for you. This is what Romans 8, chap chapter 8, verse 28 to 30 says. 20, that's what I said. Verse 28 to 30. Did you get that? Should I say it in Spanish just in case you didn't get it? This is what God is doing in your life. This is the purpose that God has for you. This is why Paul said, whatever you do in food or drink, do all to the glory of God. The very first time I, uh, maybe it was the second time, I went shooting. Uh, I had a 45 Sig, Sig Sawyer, for those of you who don't like guns, just get over it for a minute. But I went shooting with a bunch of friends, and I hadn't really ever shot that much before. And so I've got this gun. It's a pretty big handgun, right? And we're out in the desert. There's all these targets set up. And I'm just like, bam, 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 bam. I mean, bullets flying everywhere. And my friend next to me, he looked at me, and he said, you know, it might help if you aimed. <laughs> and I thought, that, I, I was wondering why I wasn't hitting the target, you know? <laughs> Dust clouds flying up everywhere. Listen, you can't hit a target without aiming. You cannot hit a target without aiming. And what you are aiming for is the glory of God. This is what you're aiming for. You're aiming for the glory of God. This is God's purpose. This is what sanctification is. It means that you and I have joined in God's plan for our life. We are going to fly into his presence bearing the image of Jesus. That's our target. So if that's our target, life isn't about anymore what I can do or I can't do. That's not what Christianity is about, what I can do or what I can't do. What Christianity is about is this. Does this glorify God or does this not glorify God? Does this not glorify God? Because if it doesn't, I don't want to think it. Does this action glorify God? Because if it doesn't, I don't want to do it. Do these words glorify God? Because if they don't, I don't want to speak it. Because this is God's, this is what I'm aiming for. This is my target. My target isn't some human being who's a leader in the church, albeit there are good patterns to follow. My target is the image of Jesus Christ. And so I'm not constrained anymore by the law, what I can do or what I can't do. I am constrained now by what glorifies God or what doesn't glorify God. Don't live like a worm when God is making you a butterfly, all right? Don't live like a worm when God is making you a butterfly. Don't slither on the ground when God is giving you wings to fly. This is what he's doing in our life. This is what he does by the power of God's Holy Spirit. As he has set us free from the law, 
we now find liberty, grace, and freedom in the work of Christ on the cross. Live it, rejoice in it, set your target on the glory of God, and as you live your life out, do all things, whether you're speaking, thinking, or doing, for his glory and for his glory alone. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word today. We don't want to set our targets. God, we don't want to set our aim on anything other than your will. And we know that, God, our, our lives are not about, they're not constrained by the law anymore. You've freed us from the burden and the weight that we were carrying. I pray today that we would set our targets on the image of your son. This is the very thing that you're doing in our lives. On the inside, which matters so much more than the outside. I pray today for those who are burdened in this room, God, struggling with failure. I pray that they would You'd give them the strength to come to the cross, to come to the cross, to come to the empty tomb, to be refreshed and renewed, to join in your process of sanctification, to surrender and to yield and to submit to your plan and to see things your way. God, would you grant that today for every weary soul, for every burdened heart? I pray today, God, for the lost among us. I pray today, God, that you lead them to Jesus, your son, who went to the mountain, who bore the penalty and the wrath and the God-forsakenness, who offered a perfect sacrifice once and for all, and who was gloriously raised from the dead on the third day. Father, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for Jesus. This morning, as our eyes are closed, as our heads are bowed, today, have you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ? Listen, maybe God spoke to you today. Maybe he is speaking to you right now. Maybe today, right here in this place, the way that you have seen Christianity has changed completely. Maybe you perceived it as a set of rules, cans and can'ts, do's and don'ts. Maybe you've had this perception that somehow it's about your morality or your keeping of religious tradition. But today God has spoken to you. Today you come into this place bearing a weight and a burden. Today you come into this place, you've struggled, you have failed, you've tried Everything that the world has offered to numb and to distract, this overwhelming sense of failure in your life, this weight that's heavy on your heart, this burden you've been carrying, I want to tell you today, it can be lifted. It, it can be lifted today. This is why Jesus came. He came to lift the burden. He came to free you. He came to pour out his grace upon your life. He came to set you free. He came to save you. He is God's Savior. And this is the message of Christianity. If you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, if you believe in the sacrifice that he made on the cross for you in his resurrection from the dead on the third day, if you yield and surrender your life to him as Lord, the Bible says that your sins will be forgiven by God. The Bible says you will become his son or his daughter. The Bible says you'll be granted the gift of everlasting life. God will begin this glorious process of transformation in your life. This is what your heart has been longing for. This is what will truly satisfy and fulfill you. Today, if you've never taken that step of faith, today you've never been born again, and today you know you need to believe in Jesus Christ. You, you want to believe. You want to commit your life to him. Right where you're sitting today, if this is you, as God has spoken to you, I want to pray for you. 
God is speaking to you this morning. You want to take this step of faith. You want all that God has for you today right where you're sitting. I want to pray for you that God will give you the courage and strength to take this step of faith. And so I'm going to ask you today, just raise your hand this morning. Today acknowledge that you want the Lord Jesus Christ in your life just by raising your hand. Stretch your hand up high this morning. I want to see who you are. I want to pray for you today. God bless you here in the front. Thank you for raising your hand. I see your hand here in the front as well, sir. Thank you for raising your hand. I see your hand over here on my left. God bless you. He loves you so much. Anybody else today? As God is speaking to your heart, take this step of faith. Receive today everything that God has. Would you raise your hand this morning? I want to pray for you. You're in the overflow this morning. I want to encourage you today just to raise your hand. Our elders want to acknowledge you. Listen, this morning, maybe you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been walking in the world. Maybe you've gone back to a performance-based relationship with God. You need to come home to him. You need to come back to the cross and to the empty tomb. Today, if this is you, I want to pray for you too. I'm going to ask you this morning, just raise your hand. If this is you this morning, God is speaking to you. You're prodigal in your relationship with God. You need to come back to him you need to be refreshed and revived and renewed would you raise your hand this morning I just want to see who you are God bless you I see your hand he loves you man anybody else one more moment get your hand up high I see your hand right here thank you for raising your hand it's awesome father we love you so much God bless these precious people now we pray you grant them strength, courage, God, to take this single step of faith that you've required. And Father, please, as they take this step of faith, we, we know, God, you are going to do great things in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'm going to ask you guys, please, no movement in the sanctuary this morning. This is the most important part of our service. Today, for those of you who have raised your hands, God has touched your heart. You are either giving your life to Jesus Christ for the first time Maybe you're recommitting your life to him. Today, I want to lead you in a very simple prayer. It's a prayer of repentance. The word repent simply means this, that as I lead you in prayer, you're going to confess to God what he already knows, that you've sinned against him. Today in prayer, as you're making this your prayer to him, you're going to be turning away from that sin. It's a prayer of trust and faith. You're going to be believing in the gospel, confessing to the Father that you believe in the Son and all that he has done for you on the cross that he rose again on the third day. As you make this your prayer, the Bible says this, God is gonna save you, God's gonna do an amazing thing in your life. He's gonna begin this glorious process of transformation. He's gonna give you the assurance of everlasting life. He's gonna make you a son or daughter. Today, I wanna lead you in this prayer. Jesus, when he called his disciples, he called all of them publicly. He said to Matthew while he was by his tax collecting table, he said, Matthew, come and follow me. The Bible says Matthew got up. He publicly identified himself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, I want to lead you in this prayer. I'm going to call you publicly as well. Listen, not to embarrass you this morning, I want to give you the privilege today. It's a privilege to be able to identify yourself publicly with the Lord Jesus Christ. So Tony is going to lead us in a song of worship. Today, if you raise your hand, either to give your life to the Lord or to recommit your life to him, what I'd like you all to do right now is just stand up, come on forward to the front this morning. Don't be afraid today as God has touched your heart. Right now as Tony leads us, just stand up right now, come on forward to the front. I want to lead you in prayer. Refuge for the poor, the shelter from the storm, this is our God. He will wipe away your tears and return your wasted years. This is our God. So call upon his name. He is mighty to save. This is our God. This is the one we have waited for. This is the one.
before I lead this in one, one in prayer this morning, I know there's some more of you today, and I'd love to come down today and pick you up and bring you up front, but you need to take the stand for Jesus Christ yourself. You can do this today. We love you this morning. We love all that God is doing in your life. God wants to bless your life today. Don't say no. Don't turn away. Don't walk out of here without receiving all that God has for you. Today, if this is you, right, you can stand up right now. Come on forward to the front. Say yes to God. You've said no to him for far too long. Today, the Bible says, is the day of salvation. And so before I lead this precious one in prayer today, very thankful for all that God is doing in his life, I want to give you one more moment. You're not getting off that easy today. I want to give you one more moment. We love you. Take a step into the light this morning. Stand up right now and come forward and let God do what he wants to do in your life. God bless you. It's awesome. A father to the orphan and a healer for the broken. This is our God. He brings peace to my madness and comfort in my sadness. This is our God. So call upon his name. He is mighty to say, this is our God. This is the one we have waited for. This is the one we have waited for. This is the one we have waited for. Jesus, Lord and Savior. If there's anybody else this morning, I'm gonna, I want to argue you out of your seat, all right? I want to argue you out of your seat today. God is so good. He is so good. I never could have imagined how good God would be until I stood up and went forward and gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I had no clue, no clue how good God would be. If there's anybody else here this morning, you're in the midst of a battle today, you're making a decision for eternity. Do you understand today? A decision for eternity. This is the single most important decision you will ever make. And so as God is moving on lives this morning, if there's one more person, if this is you today, if this is you today, I am speaking what you're thinking today. It's not me, it's the Holy Spirit. And He is calling you. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. If there's one more person before I lead these in prayer, you need to stand up right now, make a decision, a decision. Stop battling, stop arguing in your mind, stop weighing the pros and cons. Stand up right now and come forward. Is there anybody else? If this is you, we want to give you one more moment. A fountain for the thirsty, and a lover to the lonely. This is our God. He brings glory to the humble and crowns for the faithful. This is our God. So call upon his name. He is mighty to say, this is our God. All right, I'm going to lead you guys in prayer this morning. This prayer is not to me, it's not to this church, it's to God through his son, Jesus Christ. If you're in the overflow this morning, I want you to follow along in this prayer as well. Pray believing today, because as you make this prayer to God, he is going to do great things in your lives. Let's bow our heads together. Repeat this prayer out loud after me. Dear God, today I give you my life. Today I confess I've sinned against you. I'm turning away from my sin. I'm turning to Jesus, your son. I believe he died for me, that he rose on the third day, that through faith in him, God, you have forgiven me. God, you've made me your child. God, you've given to me 
gift of everlasting life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to live for you. I want to be your disciple. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. May the Lord bless you, revive you, refresh you, strengthen you. May the Holy Spirit fill your cup this week. In Jesus' name. Amen.